Good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Scar. Uh, I'm the CEO of Royal Lifesaving, and very proudly, uh, I was uh, one of the conveners of the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in 2011 in Da Nang, Vietnam. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which this webinar is taking place here in Sydney, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, we honour their uh, elders, past, present, and future. And as an organisation, Royal Lifesaving commits to reconciliation. Um, I'd also like to, uh, to wish many of our, our friends uh, celebrating Eid in the next couple of days. Uh, we wish you Eid Mubarak and wish you all the best, you and your family. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to start the webinar. So the first section in the webinar will actually talk about the World Conference on Drowning Prevention. And um, we have a number of speakers that will help us to celebrate the conference. Uh, the second part of the webinar will then go to uh, a global context, a conversation about global drowning prevention in the context of both the conference and also the UN resolution. And then finally, we're going to do a Q&A with our panel all collectively together, uh, doing our best to try and answer your questions, because I know uh, we have uh, over 340 people on this call representing 51 nations, which is pretty fantastic. So thank you very much uh, for joining. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, some of you, about 30% of you, were actually in the World Conference, at the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in Da Nang, Vietnam. It was a, a wonderful event for many reasons. Um, from our perspective, we were taking you all to the front line in the fight um, against drowning. And at that time, uh, we, were, we were very much, as a community, becoming aware that 90% of drowning occurs in low- and middle-income countries. And so the concept behind this conference was very much to take people out of their comfort zone and to help them understand the realities of preventing drowning in a place like Vietnam. Vietnam is a wonderful country um, in many levels. Um, tourism, food, it's exciting, it's vibrant, and we really thought that by taking the international life-saving community, which was what we called ourselves in those days, to Vietnam that would give everyone a bit of a sense of what it would take to have an impact on that 90% of drowning that occurs in low and middle income countries. The next slide was part of our crazy plan. Um, this was one of our ideas that uh, to, to capitalise on the tourism in Vietnam and take people out into the field. Uh, the conference broke on day two and en masse, 350 people headed to buses and, and crisscrossed around the province of Da Nang and into Hoi An. And we did tourism-like activities. But in those tour tourism-like activities, the cycling, uh, the boat trips, uh, down at the beach or at the, uh, the swimming pool that we set up, we stopped and contemplated what it would take to reduce drowning in those contexts. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, there was at least one group in the cycle trip, though, that thought it was Tour de France. Uh, they came with nylons and they raced through our uh, carefully planned an hour and a half long cycle tour. Um, and uh, they finished in 25 minutes. So congratulations to the Dutch team. They did a fantastic job, um, but they missed many of the, uh, the sites of, of drowning prevention along the way. Um, the next part of our uh, legacy program was um, a wonderful commitment to scholarships. There were about 75 people that we flew in from all over Asia and Africa. And these were fully funded uh, trips that were funded by the Australian government and various other donors. Um, and that was really critical to us. It was really important that um, Vietnam uh, stood as an opportunity for people, not just in places like Australia and the US and Canada and the UK, but also people from across the region and into Africa to give them an understanding of drowning and drowning prevention and some of the, the great research that was available, um, and, but also to, to network and create relationships. Um, the cohort from Africa participated in one of the first African drowning prevention workshops. It was really very exciting. And you can see probably a familiar face to many of you uh, in that photograph, Amy Peden was, uh, was the coordinator um, of that particular program and had a great time uh, with the 75 people who really enjoyed the conference and enjoyed Da Nang. Um, the next part of our legacy program was the conference declaration. Um, some of you at least would remember that during the conference, we were busy drafting and redrafting. We debated, we argued, um, we had furious agreement on all of the elements that it would take to elevate drowning as a significant issue into the global uh, um, conversation, the global health and development conversation. The conference declaration was uh, was published shortly after the event. And it's a pretty impressive document that you'll find on the Royal Life Saving website. Um, and I'd encourage you to reflect on that if you get a chance. Hopefully someone's going to share that uh, link in the chat as, as I'm speaking. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, 
at this point, I, I probably have spent um, just a tiny amount of time talking about the excitement of the World Conference on Drowning Prevention, um, but I'd like to bring in uh, one of our early panellists, and I, with great pleasure, I'd like to invite, um, uh, introduce you to, to Douglas Pete Peterson, or Pete as we know him. Um, Pete was a US ambassador, in fact, the first UN ambassador after relations were normalised in, in Vietnam in 1997. Um, Pete was also the founder of the Alliance for Safe Children, and in many respects, we were in Vietnam because of Pete and his work. Um, and so I'd like to, uh, to introduce Pete now, and Pete will be joining us. Joining us. Fantastic. Okay. Hopefully, okay. Pete, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're not seeing Pete. We are seeing Pete. We're not hearing Pete. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't okay. be a it wouldn't be a Zoom webinar if we didn't have an early issue with the microphone. <laughs> hey, um, look, it's lovely to see you. you're joining us from Melbourne, and you're an Australian citizen now. So we're all uh, very proud of that. We we in fact you're an Australian, so another Australian making a great contribution to to drowning <laughs> prevention. Um, Pete, I'd like to start. Um, we first met in a meeting in Bangkok at the Task offices in about two thousand and three. Um, and at that time, I, I'd just like you to share with all of us what, what was the context of drowning in those days? What, what, what brought you to drowning? Why were you interested in drowning in 2003? Well, it's really, as you know, it's a very long story, uh, but I'll keep it very short. <clears throat> when I was the ambassador in Vietnam, I recognized that safety or prevention of accidents was a huge problem. And so we actually tried to take on a huge task of not just looking at drowning, but everything from traffic to dog bites. It was uh, too big of an agenda. But uh, we ultimately, after doing a number of surveys in Asian countries, it just became very obvious that if we focused on drowning prevention, that's where we would have the, the greatest impact. And that's why we started the programs in, uh, in Vietnam, because we saw that as one of the, of the countries suffering most from the loss of children from drowning, uh, the lack of drowning prevention. Yeah, I, I remember in those days, there was news coming out of a conference that you ran with UNICEF and WHO, I think it was probably in Bangkok, it was focused on child injury and Amina Rahman was there presenting Fuzzler Rahman. Um, you know, what were the barriers in those early days in terms of that challenge of getting people and organisations, including the UN agencies, to recognise drowning as an issue? Well, the first problem, of course, is money. Uh, just finding people willing to invest in uh, prevention because, uh, oddly enough, you can't prove you're saving lives if you're just working on prevention. And unless you can go out and actually put your finger on a body, uh, it's just not gonna show people what you're doing. Uh, the other, of course, was the lack of really the political will of a lot of international organizations and countries uh, to take on something that might show their country to be uh, a little weak on. They didn't want to do that. And so we had some real hurdles to go to try to get this up in front of the policymakers and to have them take it on as a serious problem that they could look at and actually by putting their uh, force together, they could actually have a major impact uh, to reduce the loss of children's lives, particularly to the loss of drowning. Yeah, I, I can remember, um... I can remember shortly after the, the World Conference, uh, sorry, it was the World Water Safety Conference in 2007, um, where we had uh, some speakers from TASC and, and there was a real energy um, from that conference, which was largely run by our friend Katarina um, and Norm Farmer. Uh, and so at that com after that conference, shortly after, I think we called you, um, Rob Bradley and I had sort of agreed that it wouldn't be a bad idea for Royal Life Saving to run a conference. And we called you an actual question. And the question was, um, are you interested and where would you like to run this event in Asia? Um, and so do you remember that conversation and do you remember the, the rationale for us taking the conference not to Bangladesh or Bangkok, but, but into Vietnam? Uh, I remember that conversation very well. And uh, it was obvious to me the place to do this was in Da Nang because we had an, a pilot program underway at that time that could demonstrate 
hands-on that uh, working to really seriously take on drowning as a preventive measure, we could have a major impact. Yeah, well, I thought certainly we appreciated um, that advice. And I remember the conference pitch for the International Lifesaving Federation was very much highlighting all of the strengths that we now know um, that Vietnam has in terms of tourism, but, but also um, the opportunity of the partnership with the Alliance for Safe Children was very much about um, leveraging the programs in Da Nang and working closely with the Vietnamese government. Um, so I, I'd like on behalf of all of us on this webinar tonight to thank you and, and to V Peterson as well, because I know that both of you are very much a very strong team in terms of your um, diplomatic actions and, and also your business contacts. So um, we're very grateful for your ongoing uh, support and service. And, and um, I, I'd also um, just finally like to ask you what you thought when you saw the UN resolution being uh, announced last week. Oh, I was delighted. You know, when we started this idea that we should work to prevent drowning, we thought it was a no brainer. We thought everybody would just jump on that idea because, you know, why not? Don't you want to save lives? Uh, but as it turns out, it has taken almost 20 years for this idea to be uh, brought up to the level of this uh, proclamation. And I couldn't be more proud of what you have done and what others have done to bring that into the United Nations uh, global view so we can save children's lives. Fantastic, Pete. Well, uh, we're going to leave you now. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the webinar and, um, and all the best to you and V in, in Melbourne. Thank you much, Justin. Thanks for putting this on. Great. Take care. Thank you. Um, I certainly think uh, that there are probably 340 people on the webinar that thought this was uh, a no-brainer. Um, I have a little bit of theory myself about uh, anything that I've described as a no-brainer over the last uh, few years tends to take a little bit more effort than, than you would realise. Um, our next speaker is coming from Vietnam. I, I do think that it was important that even though we ran a conference, which was three and a half days in Da Nang, um, it was all about the legacy in Vietnam and whether or not we could help the Vietnamese government and community to respond to the drowning issue that they were faced with. And so with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce uh, Hugh and Don from the Global Health Advocacy Incubator. She's the country de director in Vietnam. And um, that's a wonderful organization. So welcome, Hugh and lovely to see you. Well, thank you, Zesty. Um, That's great. And now um, you have a wonderful job. I, I think there's many people on this uh, webinar that would really um, be interested in your role. Can you describe your role for us just to start with? Thank you, the students. Um, first of all, uh, let me share with my acknowledgement and thanks for the student coronation in this very important virtual event. It's such a great honor to me to be here and talk about the very specific case story in Vietnam. But more importantly, we will review what has been done, but the way forward. Uh, let me introduce very quickly about our program in Vietnam. Uh, as everyone may know that Vietnam, nearly 2,000 children die for on browning every year. And this silent killer is a country leading cause of death among children under 15 years old. And since 2018, the Bloomberg Philanthropy announced the five year program, we have established a partnership to critical ensuring the success and financing sustainability for the program through our partnership with the Ministry of Labor in Valleys and Social Affairs. And in the program, we, the Global Health Advocacy Incubator and the World Health Organization are the implementing partner working closely with the Ministry to preventing child drowning in the country. And we are helping the government test, scan, and sustain the evidence-based intervention to reduce the child drowning in the country through our very specific intervention. The first, we provide the knowledge for the water safety education. And secondly, we provide the survivor swim uh, training for the children from six to 15 years old. And the current program is already put in place with a very educated human resources, government budgets and infrastructure. So the program continue without international funding in the near future. So we hope that by the end of the first five year, 2018 to 2022, we are expected to train more than 40,000 children on life saving survival stream that cover at least 20% of the national drowning burden for the children under 15. 
Fantastic. And so can you describe some of your key partners in Vietnam for us? Uh, firstly, we are working with the ministry and uh, in the country. The first leading country is the Ministry of Labor, Invalids and Social Affairs, Department of Child Affairs, who are in charge of the policy development and implementation of specific intervention to protect the rights of children. And we're also working with the Ministry of Education and Training to provide our survival stream and water safety education could be integrated into the education system. We also opened the partnership with the CSO, like the youth union, the women union, and other local INGO in the country, like We Have and Swim for Life. And in the program, we have the support for the eight province and from the provincial district and communal level. And we support them to working very closely together and raising the support, not only from the government office, but also from the private sector like the philanthropies and the other enterprises in the countries. Wow, fantastic. Um, now, so I guess the final question I have for you um, is um, I understand from talking to Jebba May that the Vietnamese ambassador to New York was quite instrumental in the group of friends. So can you talk a little bit about that really high level political support in Vietnam and what it means? Yeah, that is my great honor to be sure that the child drowning prevention or child injury prevention is a top agenda, a priority of the nation. Uh, and at that time, we are advocating the Ministry of Labor, Invalid and Social Affairs to pass the national strategy on child injury prevention for the period of 2021 to 2030. That lay out the very key solution for the survival stream and water safety education. And from the a global level, the Vietnamese government also had the great support through the ambassador to UN and to the UN system to spread out our political will. But the one thing I'm really uh, in impressive is that the local funding to make the program into practice before they release the very fundamental policy. And we hope that the major change will be coming soon in the near futures. It's, it's always great to talk to you, and I, and I know that the, the audience, um, you spoke at a safety conference just a little while ago, the one that Richard Franklin organised, and I know that there was a real buzz after you speaking. So thanks very much for joining me. You're going to come back to the panel a little bit later and join the discussion. So, But we're all going to move on and talk to Amina Rahman now. So thank you very much for your time. We'll see you a little bit later. Um, so our next speaker uh, comes all the way from Dakar in Bangladesh, and he should be very familiar to, to, to many of you. Um, Dr. Amina Rahman is one of the leading scientists for drowning prevention in low and middle income contexts. So um, good morning, uh, good afternoon to you, Amina. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, I'm assuming that you and your family and friends are, are getting busy, busy, busy to celebrate a very unusual Ed Mubarak today, tomorrow? Tomorrow, tomorrow, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. well, to everybody. We, we wish you and all of uh, all of our friends in Bangladesh uh, a blessed uh, Eid Mubarak. Um, can I start by um, talking to you not just not about the conference, but about um, the the time before the conference? And I think we knew you back then as um, one of the few non-swimming scientists involved in drowning prevention. Is it still true you can't swim? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess what I'd like you to talk about is some of those early days where you started playing and investigating uh, interventions, the interventions of Swim Safe and also the crash programs in Bangladesh in the years before the conference. Yeah, we started in, in 2005, actually. And, and at that time, uh, UL also helped us in our Swim Safe program at the very early stage. And, and at that time, we are just... Um, what should I say? We're just uh, trying to generate some evidence uh, that that drowning is preventable even in Bangladesh in a low-income country setting. <clears throat> and were there any barriers to getting that program up and running in Bangladesh? And what did what did you see those barriers as? Actually, at that time, um, people are not aware that that drowning could be preventable, and people actually didn't believe at that time that even crash program or swim safe program can prevent drowning. So, so it was, it was you know, um, maybe in, in other developing countries as well, people think it's God's will. 
it cannot be prevented you know so so uh, engagement of the people in various uh, prevention measures drowning prevention measure was not uh, that much um, that we wanted so and then gradually uh, over the periods you know with uh, various conversation with uh, the relevant stakeholders including the community leaders and to and engage them in the intervention process gradually uh, somehow people started believing no it, it works and they can see that the drowning incidents uh, was decreasing in their area day by day and then they started adopting those and, and uh, engaging themselves in the intervention programs yeah and and it's an imp impressive uh evidence base now contributed to by, by you and your colleagues at the Centre for Injury Prevention and also other organisations in Bangladesh. I'd like to show you a photo now. I mean, I share a photo with our webinar. This is, in fact, my favourite photo uh, from the conference. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this photo and what was happening during the conference? Okay. Uh, this is, uh, you can see a, a, a model of a swimming venue in Bangladesh. We put this type of structure in, in the pond uh, to teach children swimming. And uh, we had an, in, we, we took that and there, there was, a, a, we have stalls in the conference that uh, in, in Danang and uh, every organization showed different um, um, uh, materials or their innovations. So we put that in, the, in, in our stall. And when it, it is probably the photo was taken on the on the last day at the um, uh, event. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, Steve Beerman was the president of, of ILS. So we actually hand over this as a token to ILS uh, to, to show the world that this kind of low technology can help or, or reduce drowning uh, in, in low and middle income countries. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, Dr. Steve Beerman is a little bit bored during this webinar. It was only a few days that he was chatting with the Queen um, during a webinar like this. So I think <laughs> you and I, we don't necessarily match up uh, to the Queen. Um, but of course, Steve's been a, a great uh, leader and mentor and friend uh, to many of us. Um, I guess before the conference, though, we, we took, I remember, I'm um, just seeing in the chat, actually, uh, we took about um, 30 people from across the region to Bangladesh in order to experience um, yeah. your, your ponds and your crash. Um, have you got a favorite memory from that experience? Uh, probably that was the first uh, big, big group of uh, um, external visitors uh, in Bangladesh. And, and um, I myself was not very much, um, what should I say, expert on handling so many different nationalists uh, together. So it was, it was a, a kind of, you know, initially, I was nervous. I was pretty nervous whether I'll be able to uh, in, involve everyone properly. But thanks God, eventually we, we did that well. And, and um, there are a few memories, of course. Um, uh, one, one is, is uh, travel to Raigonj, if you can remember. We, we took all the, people, all the participants to Raigonj to show our precious and uh, swim safe program. An interesting thing is that it was difficult for me to take out the guests from the crashes. You know, they, they kept staying there and I was watch, you know, watching my <laughs> wristwatch because the time is <laughs> getting mm -hmm. down. So that was one, people, people liked that and loved that those places yeah. uh, when they visited, yeah. Yeah, it was a it was an important part of the conference program in the in the years leading into that. Um, my favourite story was horrifying actually. Um, that road between Dakar and Raigonj, um, for those of you that have done this trip, is like every minute you feel like you're going to be in a road crash that that it will be catastrophic to you and everyone else in the car. So for the whole three hours, every minute or so, you pause and hold your breath, hoping that your number's not up. And I think when we arrived at, in Dakar after the event. Um, I subsequently found out that my president at the time, uh, Dr. Shane Baker, had actually yeah. driven the bus halfway back to Dakar. And of course, our insurance would not have covered the, the catastrophic consequences of, uh, 
of losing 15 of our international delegates on that road while Shane was driving the bus. So I know Shane's on the call at uh, the webinar. So thank you for that, uh, that Shane. That was, uh, was something I was glad to hear about after the fact. Um, Amino, we're going to bring you back in uh, to the panel with David and Gemma, but we'll, we'll move on now. Thank you very much for your contribution to the World Conference on Drowning Prevention. We'll talk a little bit more about your experience of the resolution and where you think the field might get to in, in shortly in a moment. Um, so just as a break between reflecting on the World Conference on Drowning Prevention and moving to talk to Dr. David Meddings and, and Gemma May, we'd just like to launch a poll. Um, this poll is about the World Conference on Drowning Prevention. And there are three questions for you. These questions relate to the standard conference approach of giving awards out to the, the People's Choice Award, the, the Best Paper Award, and also the Best Abstract Award. So I'm going to give you about 20 seconds, assuming you can see that on your screen, to have a guess in terms of which person received the Best Paper, the People's Choice, and the Best Abstract. So your choices there are fairly clear. People like Professor Linda Kwan, Professor Mike Tipton, Dr. Ramana Raman, Dr. Amy Peden for the paper. Um, was it uh, Dr. Colleen Saunders, Dr. Katerina Garoja? Was it uh, Dr. Jenny Page? Or the last one I can't see on my screen, but you can, the People's Choice Awardee. Um, uh, Jenny Blitfitch, Professor Olive Kuzabini, of course, and then the abstract. So I'm going to give you another 10 seconds and we'll count that down. Five, four, three, two and one, and we'll go to the results. How well did you do? Ooh, well, 32% of you are wrong. The best paper was not Professor Linda Kwan, although that's a very strong choice. Um, it, in, it in fact was Professor Mike Tipton um, and a wonderful paper. And Mike continues to make a huge contribution to the sector um, and also to speaking at world conferences on drowning prevention, certainly in 2019 in Durban, he did a fantastic job. So who was the People's Choice Award? Uh, conference audience is absolutely right. It was Dr. Jenny Page at the time, Smith now. Uh, fantastic. And of course, the last one, which was the uh, best abstract at the event. Um, and 34% have chosen Tizzy Bennett and absolutely that was correct. So um, that's our poll. We might talk about bigger pictures now. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. David Meddings uh, to the webinar and also Gemma May. Uh, Dr. David Meddings is from the World Health Organization where he is uh, the technical specialist for drowning prevention. And Gemma <laughs> May is the international advocacy manager with the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Uh, hello, Gemma, hello, David. Morning, afternoon. Morning, afternoon. You're not Evening, as Evening, afternoon. Uh, Morning from the UK. I just had a bit of chocolate to get me through this this evening. Um, let's start with you, Gemma. Um, there was an explosion on Twitter as we were watching the UN resolution. So um, I'd like to start just by congratulating you and all of your colleagues at uh, RNLI, uh, to Helen uh, Morton and to Kate and to, every, to James, to Steve, to Tom, to everyone who contributed to this. Um, can we start? We'll get to the bigger picture stuff in a second. But just on that day, how did you actually feel watching that uh, in your lounge room, I suppose? Yeah, I was uh, in my in my lounge in Scotland where I live, and uh, and um, I was both amazed and incredibly proud about all that had been achieved uh, as the Bangladesh ambassador set out her stall to the rest of the member states, and they agreed in consensus uh, that drowning prevention is worthy of global recognition through a UN resolution for the first time in seventy five years of UN history, and all of you and all of your incredible work has contributed to that. There are many thank yous I have to make to many, many people on this call who have enabled us to ensure we can tell the story to many, many, many of those member states convincingly, uh, strongly and without doubt so that they could all get behind that and agree it. Um, so my chance if I don't get to say it again, thank you to every single person who's helped me with data, the story, what's going on in your country. We couldn't have done it without you. Thanks. Yeah, well, very well trained. Get the key messages out to start with. I was actually asking you about how you felt though as a person. Well, a yeah, prou prou proud unfold. and yeah, proud and humbled, yeah. Um, completely uh, overwhelmed really in a way in the sense of privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've only been working on this with, with colleagues for three years and you and many others know that I'm a newbie to drowning prevention, just three years, um, with a background in climate change and uh, development practice uh, from, the, from many years in the UK government. 
So, you know, it's very, very rare to have an opportunity to work on something um, like this in your lifetime, to have the privilege of trying to serve others, uh, to make something really significant happen. And whilst we always believed it, otherwise we would have never done it. Actually, when you see that ambition actually occur and occur in a at a time and a pace that was in fact quicker than uh, many expected and indeed our co-sponsors expected, um, there was a lot of overwhelming kind of joy and relief and a bit of confusion as we knit together that going, wow, we've actually done it. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> yeah, strange times, but wonderful times. And um, thanks to all of you for, yeah. for your support. Just incredible. Yep. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the res resolution in a moment. Um, I'd like to ask David, uh, Dode, uh, David, um, I think we met in about 2010, maybe 2011. Um, so I'd like to ask you more about the development of the field over that period and what you think the critical moments leading into the resolution were. Wow. That's, uh, so first of all, I, I thought we'd known each other even longer than, than 2010, but, but you might be right. Um, and really there's been you know, an incredible amount of change that's, that's happened over that, that decade. We've got a lot of things that I'm probably closer to and more familiar with in terms of the work that we've, we've been pushing forward out of WHO, but there, there's been a lot of other work done by many other people as, as Jim has alluded to. But I suppose if I step back and try and take a kind of a bird's eye view in a sense of what has really happened within the field, there has been, in my view, a really important shift towards more coherency um, in terms of the key messages coming out of the drowning prevention field. I think it's a fair um, point to, to, to say that 10, 15 years ago, our messaging as a, as a field was a little bit fragmented. And now I do think there is much more coherency around the, the things like the size of the problem, some of the some of the main solutions, and those two things are actually really really critical to um, you know to improve or expand upon sort of a base and move things within within public health. We know that coherency of mess messaging within the community is important, and we know that being able to communicate that there are simple practical cost-effective solutions to prevent the problem that, that you want to bring people on board with. Those are really, really critical things. So I think, you know, you can, you can argue about whether we've, we've been really intelligent and strategic in the way that we've approached this as a, as a, as a consortium of people. Um, but the net result, I think, is we've, we've done ourselves a big favor by kind of coalescing around some, some key key things and the and the feasibility of prevention. Um, I think kind of coupled with those uh, those things, there, there's been some important progress that the field has made in engaging with some other sectors and and exposing, if, if, if you want, some some other aspects of the problem. I mean, I think it's increasingly clear now that um, drowning, while a very important part of the problem is situated in the uh, lower age groups. You know, I mean, we, we know that 50% of global mortality is among people under the age of 25. We also know that that, you know, by definition means 50% of the problem is people over the age of 25. And the, the work that's been going on in Africa uh, over the last two or three years, I think is really, really interesting. And it's going to be presenting us with some, some new challenges because we're seeing there that the dynamics and the epidemiology is, um, Quite different than what we see in in Asia and the Western Pacific regions. So you know we're 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 sort of discovering or refining our understanding of some patterns of drowning in places that that are that are new. Uh, we've made some inroads with uh, the maritime safety sector. One of the things that Gemma didn't mention, but is is really important, and I'll just sort of flag it here. The the RNLI has been you know very very uh, graciously funding WHO to carry out the first ever. Uh, regional status reports on drowning in both the Western Pacific region as well as the Western, or sorry, as well as the Southeast Asia region. And, and that exercise has put us into contact with, you know, a whole array of different sectors within, within government, including the maritime sector, but also disaster risk reduction, et cetera. So we're, we're also, I think, making important inroads into some of these other critical uh, sectors. Yeah, so I think from uh, the World Health Organization, there's almost a, a regular pattern, right? So in 2014, 
um, you published the global report on drowning, which was uh, a great sort of elevator pitch for drowning, the initial foray. And I think Margaret Chan at the time, um, I don't do titles particularly well, but uh, 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 Dr. Margaret Chan. Um, so she described drowning at the time as a hidden epidemic, um, something yep. that needed uh, more significant resources. Um, and then in 2017, you followed that up with a, the implementation guide for drowning prevention, which you know many, many people on this webinar would have contributed to that. Um, so you mentioned briefly, and I know what you're talking about, but perhaps expand on that next publication that we can look forward to from the World Health Organization. Yeah, well, there's actually going to be two, uh, and and you're right. We've sort of, you know, from the normative aspect of our work, we we've, we've begun with wanting just to put drowning on the map as a global public health issue, and you know, in a way, sort of mark out our territory and say this we we we're ready to commit to this as an organization is an important problem. Um, but following that that report, we recognized that because we had already identified the, the key interventions that we felt there was a good evidence base for. Um, we felt it was important to follow that up with some much more practical, concrete guidance on how to go about implementing some of these things. So the implementation guide concerns that. And then it's kind of stepping back from that, that, second, uh, that, that, that second normative guidance, I felt we, we really needed to give um, the field some, I don't want to say standards, and we, we, we did sort of mull over the word standard when talking about this, but we, we sort of finally come down on best practice recommendations. So we identified three recommendations, uh, swim skills training and basic water safety training, um, provision of daycare for preschool children, and training of um, uh, uh, training of people in safe rescue and resuscitation. We felt that these three interventions would benefit from um, really sort of giving people in the field, but particularly, I suppose, people who work in low and middle income countries, very concrete guidance on, on what sort of, you know, what sort of best practices should they be looking at implementing within these, these programs, because there is a potential for for some harm to be done if those if those interventions aren't being implemented uh, correctly. Now, as we've done that, we got some feedback that it ended up uh, pushing us towards having to undertake an entire formal guideline process. So there's actually going to be two um, separate but related uh, uh, documents coming out in relatively uh, uh, in the relatively near future. The first will actually be a formal WHO guideline that looks at just two of those interventions, the daycare provision of daycare for preschool children and the, the training of school-age children in uh, swim skills and basic water safety. And then that formal guideline will be followed up with the document that we had begun with a few years ago, which is the best practice recommendation. So we're hoping that those that battery of things together will, will give people a really strong platform for you know, having some sort of uniformity and some uh, sort of shared um, methodological thinking across people working on, on drowning prevention, particularly in low and middle income settings. Yeah, there's many people on the webinar that uh, will be looking forward to the, uh, the technical guidance on swim skills and also yeah. basic rescue. I, I do think then when we talk about the field, um, in Australia alone, there's probably 40,000 people that uh, their passion is either teaching swimming or teaching basic rescue or resuscitation. So if you magnify that across the globe, that's quite a yeah. big cohort of people that know that their day-to-day -day passion is teaching swimming or, or getting involved. And I think there's some real entry points for them uh, in the, the resolution, but also it is important that they have some technical guidance um, that provides that notion of, uh, of safety through that instruction. Um, I'd like to go to, to Gemma, if I can. Uh, Gemma, we're going to look in a moment at um, a clip from the announcement of the resolution, but I'd like you to, uh, and you very generously acknowledged all the people that have contributed, um, but what I'd really like you to do is to talk about the 12 months or the two years before. What were the significant hurdles that you had to jump? David mentioned a little bit earlier about the framing of issue, which seems to be a, an ongoing key. But, but corralling people, getting them involved. I remember, I remember Helen Morton announcing uh, at the World Conference in Vancouver that this was an aspiration. And so paint the picture from Vancouver to Durban and now achieving it just in the last couple of weeks. 
Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I remember sitting and hearing Hedlin that day in Vancouver too. Um, essentially, three months later, uh, we really commenced the activity on this in New York, New York Focus. We were clear that um, this issue was worthy of being very strongly linked to the agenda that's managed and looked after in New York on the SDGs. The ambassadors of your countries that are sitting there are responsible for progress or reporting progress on the sustainable development goals. So before we even got there, we needed to make sure exactly, as David has said, there was a really clear narrative about what was the state of affairs and why was it relevant to them and, and they're relevant to their job. Um, and, uh, and to really have a very strong narrative around that. And um, we were able to secure that with, with the support of colleagues. Again, thank you. And then, and then frankly, to get in the door, no one had ever talked to any ambassador about this issue ever. And it's great to hear Pete being so open and generous, you know, but I think he's uh, one in a million. It's not many people that, that have, you know, been in experience that unless you live in or in a country where this is a burden. And then actually for many people, they think it's the norm uh, and just kind of part of life. And we wanted to show it wasn't. So narrative needed to be strong. And then frankly, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, we, we were very lucky that um, Helen and I came from a background familiar with working in the UN um, in New York in the past, from past lives, and we understood the mechanism that would potentially help secure a coalition of countries around a particular topic. And that is something called a group of friends, and they have them on group of friends on energy or on children or on malaria. And it's usually a start of like-minded and aligned countries who really recognize that a topic or issue is significant. And they informally work together to either get it very firmly on the agenda um, as a collective piece of action, or indeed negotiate um, together for particular areas of work or a global decision. My own experience was, was of that around sustainable energy. Um, was a group of friends on sustainable energy. In the end, that turned into SDG seven. So just to say that that's kind of the context. Mm. So, um, so it was about trying to um, seed the idea that, and, and working in their language and their terms, um, we think this is an important issue. Here's the evidence. Here's also the evidence that there are solutions that are available and countries that are taking action that are seeing change. And I will call out our colleagues in Thailand and Vietnam for that, particularly where there's a high burden and Bangladesh's progress. So having evidence that change was possible is really important because as Pete said, the reason it had been challenging so far was, you know, certainly at national level in many cases was the lack of political will. So what we needed to do in New York was get enough political will for change. And really that's what the resolution is about. Mm. Um, so in practical terms, just to say that, um, you know, we essentially ended up securing bilateral meetings on a one-to-one -one basis telling each ambassador this was how it was relevant to them, how it was relevant to their country, what was or wasn't being done in their country, and the ambition for a resolution. And then an invitation, you're gonna join this, we think you should. And that took several goes, <laughs> but ultimately through the course of the last two years, um, secured enough of an ambition uh, and enough of a coalition of core countries to say, this is important, we will back it, and we will lead it through our UN processes in New York, which was led to the outcome. There were some key moments of, of pivot point. I'll call out our friends in Monaco. There's a lot of people who've helped us in the background, but there were some, some moments along the journey from beyond, you know, briefing 130 countries one-to-one, -one, multiple times, multiple events, to really seeing an energy shift. And I will say that working in partnership with WHO and UNICEF in New York, making sure their staff were in those briefings en masse and being very clear about where, the, where this issue was relevant to WHO and UNICEF agendas, where those member states are on executive boards making major funding decisions was really, really important. So it really has been a team effort. A team effort, yeah. So there's two, there's two countries that um, were essentially the proposers, quite critical. Um, and we're gonna go to Bangladesh in a moment, but Ireland was, was one of those. Um, and John Leach asked me to, uh, from Water Safety Ireland asked me to, to put in a plug for Ireland. And I, and I joked on social media that on that day, I, I didn't speak to a drowning prevention person that wasn't just a little bit Irish um, and proud, uh, proud Irish person, um, given the Irish had sort of lent in. And, and I think it was the symmetry of Ireland and Bangladesh for mine was 
that the island drowning is very high income and focus. And so many of us can relate to their life-saving programs, their focus on, on boating and alcohol as a factor in drowning. And so um, from that perspective, I think it was good that Ireland was there because it gave us many of the high income life-saving people a bit of a sense of um, how they had leaned in that this was not just about the 90% of drowning that was low in middle end countries. Um, but I'd like, uh, David's mentioned framing of drowning and you reinforced the importance of that. Um, I think we should do a masterclass in framing of drowning now. And I'd like to play the video of uh, Rabab Fatma, Her ex Excellency, sorry, the ambassador for Bangladesh at the UN in New York. And I think this is a masterclass in the framing of drowning. Mr. President, in the last decade alone, more than 2.5 million lives were lost to the water, needlessly. Infants slipping silently into ponds, fathers never returning from fishing trips, sisters submerged on their way to school, wasted lives and preventable deaths on an epidemic scale. Drowning is a major and neglected cause of global mortality. 235,000 lives lost every year, 650 every day, 26 every hour. Astounding, staggering figures. Annually, a greater loss of life than to maternal mortality and malnutrition. It is an issue without geographical borders and boundaries. Anyone, anywhere can drown. It affects every nation of the world and some more dramatically and inequitably than others. Over 90% of deaths occur in low and middle income countries, the highest rates recorded in Africa and the greatest numbers across Asia, with children and young people representing the majority of lives lost, our future. Despite its global burden, Yeah, thank you. I know I got uh, shivers uh, watching that. I actually, I thought Gemma, the really interesting thing about uh, her excellency was that she was actively engaging on social media with so many people. I, I think I saw her like a tweet from Amy Peden last week of Amy in an airport lounge with her young children. So um, she's really one of us now. Um, can you she's tell us a little bit about woman. her? Yeah. yeah, she's a remarkable woman. <laughs> um, sorry for interrupting you. Um, yeah. She, she's been a, she's a career diplomat. Um, her, she's been in post in New York for around uh, 15 months, actually, joined at the end of 2019, I think. Um, and her previous posting was in Japan. Um, she holds, she is a rising and significant star in the world of New York, there's no question. And um, that is a great benefit to us. She, when we were able to brief her on this, um, her outgoing predecessor had been extremely supportive. And it's never a given that one ambassador leaves uh, and the, the, the new incumbent takes something on. Um, but she saw this issue very strongly and she recognized the need at home, but also the opportunity. Uh, as we all know, Bangladesh has the legitimacy to be the voice um, of this issue, along with a number of other uh, member states. And Vietnam and Thailand have been very, very strong members of the group of friends, and it's important that we acknowledge them. Um, but in the end, they were able to you know, uh, we, at the end, we only need uh, one sponsor, but we got two. <laughs> you just need someone to really grab it. And that dynamic between the two, I will just touch on that, between Ireland and Bangladesh is quite a deliberate thing, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But, but Ambassador Rabab is passionate. She gets it. She's a rising star in New York. She is involved in many um, very, very significant official roles uh, amongst member states and her peers in New York. Um, uh, and... Uh, and so that's also important, you know, her, her weight behind something matters. Mm -hmm. She is also um, on the executive board of UNICEF. Um, so she also understands the importance around this for um, children. And she wants to use her space on that platform for making sure that, you know, the majority of burden where it's felt strongly is, is raised and significant. Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a very well-framed speech. Um, uh, David, you mentioned earlier just this notion of the intersections of drowning out of the field and into other areas. Um, the first part of the resolution, which I, I think maybe we call the recitals part, it's, but it's basically that first section that lists all of the intersections for drowning. Um, that, well, sorry, all of, all of the areas where the resolution may in fact need to intersect with other UN 
um, uh, artifacts, actually. Um, things like the SDGs, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, the, uh, the UNSDR Sendai framework is in that list. I think there's a health for all, uh, sorry, universal health linkage. Um, Dave, what do you see the challenge in, in the drowning field reaching out to some of those other sectors? Yeah, I don't know if we should think of it as a challenge as much as a, as an opportunity. And I've seen in the chat that there's there's lots of people sort of asking and, and wanting to get at how are we best going to be able to leverage the UN resolution. I actually think that's one of the one of the things that this UN resolution is is offering us. It's offering us very explicitly the opportunity to uh, collaborate with a range of other sectors. You know, the resolution does call upon WHO, and I, I think you're going to show us some slides a little bit later. Uh, that actually walk us through the resolution, um, but it 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 asks WHO to coordinate within the UN system uh, the activities of the UN family uh, with regard to drowning prevention, and then it actually uh, uh, lists a number of specific UN entities uh, yeah. that are involved there, including the uh, disaster um, uh, area, but also uh UNDP, UN um, UNICEF, etc. So so I think there's there's ample opportunity that we can sort of take, and I don't mean we as in WHO, but but the the, the, the drowning prevention community collectively to engage with other other sectors. I think it's very important that people on this uh, webinar understand that there were, if I'm not mistaken, 81 um member states that actually aligned themselves or co-sponsored the the the, the resolution. And that's really important to know if your if your country is actually on that list, because which is available from uh, from from the UN website, because uh, we did actually try and get a World Health Assembly resolution on drowning first, and it failed. And one of the reasons that it failed was because we were told within WHO that this needed to have more member state support. So. If we want to actually sort of work within this resolution framework to advance the issues, it will mean, uh, you know, engaging more with other sectors, yes, but it will also benefit from our uh, cultivating the political environment where we get a range of successive resolutions, both within the UN General Assembly, but also within the World Health Assembly. That's a really, that's a really effective tool to help us to, to, to do our job, actually. Yeah, the, the second part of the resolution frames drowning. Um, and so one of the things, uh, Dan Ryan, actually a colleague of yours, Gemma, uh, sent me a question overnight. And he was, so he was, I think his question is really interesting in that, that when we met at the conference in Vietnam, there was this tension about how big drowning was. Um, and we were framing drowning as, you know, it was 450,000 people dying by drowning each and every year, officially under WHO, but there was this big debate, debate about perhaps that didn't necessarily uh, be, it wasn't a full representation of the drowning burden. And so at the time, I think we were talking about a million and astounding people. Um, and then I think when you released the global report on drowning, that number was down to 320. And then in the recital of um, the UN resolution, it was very close to 200,000. So drowning has reduced in that 10 year period substantially, almost 50% across the globe, according to those official numbers. Um, so it seems that the number was never important um, and that, that the framing of the issue within the other areas of that UN resolution are possibly far more critical than um, that number. Do you agree with that, Gemma? Um, I think the number is important. I think, um, I think when you, we, we, we started to use some framing, I think the first time around in Durban, actually, where we went, okay, well, how much is it over sort of 10 years? It's a lot, 2.5 million now in 10 years. Mm. If that's and that's based on you know WHO estimates, the current ones, the ones that have been released in in November 2020, um, and you know we know that those deaths do not capture uh, climate related deaths, for example, from flooding or from transport related accidents. And we know that in some regions of the world, those transport related accidents are quite significant. You know, for the region, for a particular nation, or what have you, and so. You know, frankly, how, ma how many lives are too many? I think I use that mm -hmm. phrase in Durban, like, you know, if it affects you and your family, your neighbor, your friends, whatever, it's, and it's preventable, it, it one life's too many. And um, so I think the numbers were important, but actually maybe on an annual basis a little bit, but actually putting to them together as a kind of collective over a decade, that felt a lot more significant. 
And in terms of feedback that one got when one told the story either collectively to a group of ambassadors or individually, their face, there was never once when anybody went, oh, mm. that's not very much. They always said, I can't believe that. That's incredible. And also the opportunity very often when you opened up the conversation or took a pause to reflect, the number of stories I have had personally of you know, people in high levels who very generously revealed this had happened to them or their family members. It's extremely humbling. So, you know, we're not talking about this. Uh, it, there's, there's a lot of complexity around it. And so bringing to life that, that thing where it you know, affects people. And I remember about a year ago, uh, the, the ambassador of Guyana, who was head of the group of 77 countries, he stood up in a, in a meeting of um, about, about 60 member states from um, Alliance of Small Island States after a presentation we made and he said, this really matters. You've made a compelling case. And he said, but I want to tell all of you, my peers, this is personal to me. Mm. My father drowned. This affects all of us. I mean, mm. it's kind of, you can hear a pin drop when that happens. So I think the numbers are important, um, but I think the collective number, it's pretty eye-opening when you bring it yeah. together. It's pretty hard to ignore. Once you open the genie box as well, you know, you can't let it, you can't let it go. You can't not see it. You can't not hear mm. it anymore. And that's quite powerful. Fantastic. Justin, can and so I you, just you... jump in on, on Gemma's sure, response Dave. and say, say one thing about the, the numbers? Because I, I think it's uh, I think it's important that uh, well, one thing as you as you've alluded to, those numbers have been declining over over the years, and that may be because we are getting more precision with uh, with some of our estimates. Our estimates are informed by. Um, all sorts of national surveys that take place. So, for example, the, the latest work that uh, Bloomberg has been funding the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to do in Eastern Africa, plus some other high-quality studies out of Tanzania, those will likely um, inform our, our, our future estimates on, on the patterns of drowning mortality in, in Eastern Africa and may, mm. may make some changes. But um, one of the things that John Connolly has uh, has pointed out on, on, on the questions and answers, and it's good to see John is on, on this webinar, is that within the WHO estimates, the global health estimates, we actually are very explicit in, in stating what our estimates do and do not cover. So we explicitly state that they do not cover um, intentional uh, drownings, either self-harm self or, or homicide by drowning. They don't cover water transport or, or disaster-related uh, drownings. And John makes the point, and I think he's absolutely correct, that people who are working in the drowning space and publishing papers about, about drowning, if they're using the WHO estimates, um, they should actually also include that, that qualification pub, uh, paragraph or sentence mm -hmm. that WHO gives that actually sets out the, if you want, the limitations of our, of our estimates. So just wanted to throw that in there as, as a partial answer to John's uh, very good point. Yeah, but, but I, I think if you combine that robustness around um, the burden of drowning, including non-fatal drowning, and, and you certainly you're doing a big body of work around non-fatal drowning, mm -hmm. Um, with Emma's points, uh, sorry, Gemma's points about um, connecting personally, storytelling and trying to connect and reach out to people. I, you know, I think that's a really valuable lesson for lots of people on the webinar that um, one alone is never enough. Um, you can't just advocate on the basis of numbers without necessarily storytelling and trying to personalise the experience or reach out to people that are fact being impacted by, um, by the issue. And so you know, in Australia, um, Michael Morris of the Samuel Morris Foundation is one, you know, leading example of, um, a, you know, a personal story is very difficult for people to say no to and they can connect more um, consistently with someone that is able to talk from that pers perspective of experience um, and link it with some good data in, in, in the advocacy model. Um, I was going to um, play just another little bit of uh, Ambassador Rubbub because um, she then went on to contextualise this to Bangladesh, and I thought this was a beautiful little section within the presentation. My own country, Bangladesh, is on the front line in the fight against drowning. Bangladesh's own journey of recognition and response to drowning has been continuing for well over a decade. And I'm happy to report that we are making progress, as are several other regional neighbours who, like us, experience a high drowning burden especially amongst our children. 
We are making progress with the development of a national drowning prevention plan and action at community level in developing, test, testing, and adapting interventions that can and are saving lives at rel relative low cost. And how so? We are ensuring young children are supervised and kept safe around water by caregivers, that barriers or fencing is installed around open waters such as ponds and wells, that young children have the opportunity to learn swimming skills that may save their lives. So um, Ambassador Rabab there is, is talking about the, uh, the Bangladeshi context, um, but she's also starting to link out some of the successes that they've had in Bangladesh, which sort of leads us to this, the third part of the resolution itself, which starts listing out the member state actions. Um, and so in those actions, um, I think it's something like um, provide a focal point for drowning, uh, develop a national water safety, a drowning prevention plan, um, uh, public awareness campaigns. Um, Gemma, how did they, they emerge as a set that went into the resolution? Thanks, Justin. Well, um, it was quite clear, and David has articulated, you know, the, the incredible journey that's happened over the last 10 years and the really um, seminal and important work uh, that, uh, that WHO has put forward um, for recommendations of interventions that we know work, um, particularly from, a, from, around, from a range, a range of um, settings. So if you look at those, and in the, in, the, <laughs> in the practical sense, this is the operative text of the resolution. It's around uh, paragraphs, uh, let me see, uh, from about paragraph 13, it really builds on the recommendations that WHO have made. I mean, and in the negotiation period, you know, they, they were put forward. Um, I will say that they were all kept through negotiations by member states, which was really great. We were not sure about that. They could have been struck off. And actually, you know, as a sector, we were nervous. It's like, you know, we all know those are all really important, depending on your setting. But they were retained and in some instances strengthened. So, um, and I particularly call out um, uh, Thailand for strengthening some of those around sort of technology and um, it continuing to really sound the opportunity for regional knowledge exchange, which you and many colleagues have advanced in, in several years. But the opportunity, particularly for those who are just starting on their journey at say in Lao or in, in Indonesia, um, and these are member states that are participating in WHO's um, regional status reports to come out later this year. They are starting at zero, so they really need to learn from neighbours. So we built on recommendations that are put forward. They were strengthened and retained. It's a kind of buffet option, if you will. And the really important thing to say is here is these are voluntary. Um, these are countries and member states that are invited to look at that list and think about their and um, their national circumstances. We hope that um, by looking at that list, perhaps. You haven't got a plan yet, but you're trying to work towards it. So maybe this is the incentive to get together and around that to maybe make that happen. Perhaps you've got a coordination mechanism isn't a coordination mechanism that isn't quite working between different parts of the drowning prevention family. Now's the time to come together to really make that work. Um, perhaps you know that you could really do more on um, awareness and behavior change. Really, whether you're in Europe, North America, Africa or Asia, uh, we believe that that set of options allows you to really think about your nat national context and see how you can address the gaps or pass the barriers that you have already. Um, David, when you reflect on that part of the resolution and those list of actions, um, is there anything missing? Um, it's a good question. Uh... I'm not really sure. I mean, I think I think I suppose if we get into the nitty gritty of it, I I would have preferred that that, for example, we we've been actually very um, very fortunate. I think uh, WHO to be uh, having a really good relationship with the International Maritime Organization, and I was a little bit and and the maritime safety, the water transport um, side of, of of drowning is I think important, and that particular entity is really looking forward to, to working with us and has been working with us on, uh, on a range of issues. But I was a little surprised that they weren't one of the uh, UN uh, organizations explicitly uh, mm -hmm. mentioned. But you know that doesn't stop us from, from working with them. Um, 
the resolution also didn't call for something that I know uh, you and I and, and Steve Bierman in particular have been working pretty hard on over the years, which is this idea of a global drowning prevention partnership. And that was a specific recommendation of the uh, global report on drowning in 2014. Um, but I think the resolution puts us in a very good uh, place to to lobby for that uh, to you know to to sort of come into the drowning prevention landscape. So you know yeah there there could have been a few things that, that might have been added into the text, but these things are always a sort of a complex negotiation. And at the end of the day, I think the really important thing is that we just have to see this as another another yeah. sort of a platform in this in this. Um, uh, house that we're all collectively uh, building together. So it's a really, really useful thing to have, and we have to we have to build uh, build on it. So I do hope, by the way, that there there's a call in that resolution for uh, July the 25th to be uh, to be commemorating uh, World Drowning Prevention Day every every year, and WHO has been asked to facilitate the observance of that date. We are very uh, receptive to ideas uh, from people on this call in particular as to what sort of thing people would most find helpful for, yeah. for WHO to, to pull together. It's going to be the first time we've ever done this. We've got really very little time to, to do it just because of the, the, the timing for when the resolution was, was adopted. Um, so I'm having a our first planning meeting next week to to begin to sort of really talk talk that through. So if people on the chat uh, or in questions sort of want to raise or comments want to raise what they think we might best do mm. to commemorate July the twenty fifth, I'm I'm very very open to hearing about that. Yeah, we've got a we've got a question coming up on that specifically. But what what I'd like to do is add Aminur, um and also Huan. Uh, to a discussion and let's go I, I'm not I'm having trouble seeing the Q&A from here uh, the computer crashed but I've got a set of preloaded questions and uh, maybe uh, everyone can keep an eye on the chat and the Q&A and also we'll go to these uh, these formatted questions uh, there we all are welcome back um, I hope you're enjoying the webinar um, from the other side um, and so we've got a couple of questions that were extracted from people when they registered and I think these questions are also playing out uh, in the, the chat and also the Q&A. So let's go to the first question. I'm going to magically become really small and in the corner. Um, and the first question is about success. So this is a higher level question. A number of people asked this. And it was essentially, what does success look like in about 2030, 10 years downstream? Um, what would we, we be celebrating? And what would those steps to get to that destination be, do you think? Um, and so maybe um, maybe uh, let's start with you, Gemma. What do you think 2030 looks like in relation to drowning prevention? In terms of being able to uh, maybe measure, you could use the resolution as a framework to measure success, if you will. And you could take all of those um, operative items, those buffet options of action to say what's starting to change. So it will require us to make an assessment as a community coordinated by someone but I would like success to be looking very different that says we will have many more plans and policies in existence and being implemented and um, a reduction in drowning numbers arising from that. Um, I'd like to be, I'd, I'd expect to see um, much better data on the, on, on being integrated into national systems. So we understand uh, what's going on. I would expect of course, to see a lot more investment from national budgets, um, and from the donor community as a whole into this issue. Now that could be a standalone, but also uh, it would be excellent to see inclusion of drowning prevention as part of, for example, climate change investment. And in particular, I would say, um, as part of, for example, green climate fund money, uh, where um, there's a potentially a link with uh, community resilience and adaptation. So it will require us to do some assessment from where we are now to where we are in the future, but compared to our baseline, and with the exception of you know, great progress in um, many higher income countries, frankly, the baseline right now is incredibly low. And actually that we're being told that from, from our WHO regional assessments. So there really is a op tremendous opportunity to see all real growth and change. So I'd like to use that as real encouragement for the community. Mm -hmm. um, that in itself will be really substantial. But really what's important is that we continue to monitor, track and, ev and evaluate those interventions. And I really encourage national um, governments or, or anybody doing this work to do that. 
because part of the reason we were able to secure this was because we had evidence from your work to tell those political leaders, this is what works, this is the evidence we're seeing, but we need much, much more. Um, we need to be able to tell the story. So my plea is get out there, evaluate your work, tell the story, because by doing that, you will give uh, no doubt about the impact of those interventions and the difference they're making and the relevance to national agendas. Thanks. Thanks, Gemma. What about you, David? What does success look like in 2030? I think Gemma hit a lot of the, uh, the major points and I, I, I would kind of, I guess, go a little bit from what Gemma was, was mentioning to giving the example that uh, Huyen talked about earlier in, in Vietnam. I think that's actually, it's a model, it's a model sort of case. If every country could do what Vietnam has done where they've, they've essentially got a national uh, action plan now for, I think it's 2021, 2030, Huyen, uh, and that is, that's got explicit, um, Objectives in there for for drowning prevention that are evidence that are evidence based. So um, it's a mix of things like that at, at national level. Uh, some uh, I do think it would be a very good idea to have a, a global partnership that becomes formalized and is is consecrated to to working on on drowning prevention. Um, and then better better data, which Jenna mentioned, but. I already know that that data is going to oblige us to look at a different dynamic of drowning that uh, that is really about young men and risk taking and uh, occupational uh, risks in in some of the uh, settings in, in in Africa that I think for the moment we have less kind of complete solutions for. Um, but I do see a lot of hope in bringing in countries like experts from Australia or or Canada for that matter who do have similar drowning dynamics taking place in those high income settings where we can begin to sort of think about think through well how can we actually bring in some of those lessons learned into settings like um, like eastern mm. africa yeah thanks we might go to the next question because the next question um, comes down to that country level and you've talked about action at a country level the question is um, how are countries expected to implement the resolution and how can a country level drowning prevention field support this process um, so I might take this question first to when um, you've had a look at the resolution and you're working actively in Vietnam. Um, what do you think needs to happen at a country level in response to this resolution? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Justine. I, I would like to uh, propose two um, solution to implement the UN resolution. The first of all, but very important, that is the joint action among the collaborating agency. I think that uh, we are from the global advocacy uh, organization. So we are re really focused on how to sustain the policy and make it into practice. I think that at the first beginning, working with the right agency, identify who is the most influencing and coordinating agency is so very important. And we should be being clear about the vision from the outset that is a very major success factor for the program. The conservation among the not only government agency from the center to the local levels, but also the other factor organization like NGO, academic institution, or uh, even social organization is really important. The conversation, not only how the program begin, but how it will be end to sustain the ability and to be sure that ownership is very, is very critical piece of our work. And the second, the second solution I'm really concerned is about the program sustainability. I think that the political commitment and the local ownership is very important. And the public financing for the intervention should be increased every year, not only from the government budget, but also for in-kind contribution from the locality. And, um, from our experience during the nearly the three years of intervention, the program, we invested nearly 30 US dollars per child for their survival stream and the water safety education. It's very worth to pay off this amount of money to reduce 90% the risk of child drowning. During the COVID uh, pandemic uh, in everywhere and in Vietnam in particular, we can call that it's just like the kind of vaccination for the worth of investment for the country, especially for child to prevent them from child drowning. This kind of intervention and vaccination is really 
uh, priceless to let try uh, survive from drowning. So that is my additional solution. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Fantastic, thanks, Yuen. Um, I can see lots of chat. I think your mention of COVID uh, aligns to many of the comments that are going on in the chat and the questions at the moment. I, obviously, many countries now are, are dealing with COVID and uh, planning a summer um, with COVID. And, and I know that there's a number of people that have mentioned uh, children are not having access to, to swimming. Um, so I think at that country level, I, I think there's a, a real uh, energy from NGOs in our field wondering how they can get connected to the resolution, how they can use the resolution to generate some local activity. Um, and so, I mean, have you done anything in the last week with the UN resolution in Bangladesh? What are the sorts of actions you would advise people to, to, to undertake in the next couple of weeks? Couple of weeks, it would be difficult, but maybe a maybe couple of years. <laughs> um, yes, weeks. Now, first of yeah. all, I would like to say that the UN resolution, particularly for the low and middle income countries is, is, a, is a wake up call, you know? And each nation, especially the low and middle income country nations, their own uh, plan uh, for drowning prevention or drowning prevention strategy, which is the most needed thing at the moment. And of course, there are some proven interventions and there are, it has been proven that those are, are, are effective and, and also uh, have, they, they have got scale, scalability as well. So now it's time for the government and other um, relevant st uh, stakeholders to take action. So mm. this is the high time, I should say. <clears throat> okay. Um, Gemma, would you encourage people to write to their local members of parliament and draw attention to the resolution? Um, would you encourage people that are running swimming programs to write to parents and remind them of the resolution? What sort of really tangible things can people on the webinar do in the next couple of weeks to draw attention to the resolution? And is that a helpful thing or a harmful thing? Write for your life is what I say. This, this resolution is for all of you. This is for, for, for all of you to help you do your work. You are all extraordinary in what you do. You are at the coalface of making change happen. And I suppose if you, again, if you look at what countries and member states are invited to do. Maybe they're starting on the journey and they're doing nothing at all. But you know, as a practitioner, this is a big issue. You should be using this document as a way to have a conversation with your local or uh, national political leaders and say, guess what? This is, in, this is endorsed by consensus. All member states agreed. Yes, there are 80 odd countries that have got their name to it, but just for our European colleagues to know, the European group uh, negotiated as a block so, um, you know, all of Europe is in that bucket as well, uh, as well as a couple that individually called themselves out. So think about how this, um, this could be relevant to your work. As I said before, where are your current blockers? You know, what, where are you struggling to get traction perhaps with your state or your, uh, your provincial uh, entity or your national government? What's right for you? And use this document to say, well, do you know what? For the first time there has been consensus, this matters. Um, there is political weight behind this and use it to start to have the conversation to unblock the challenges that you have, um, whether that's and, and to remind uh, and remind you, you know, friends or neighbours where there may be challenges. You know, just to give you an example, in the UK, there have been a number of petitions um, from folks who have lost loved ones to drowning. Uh, our own situation around um, how water safety is included in the national curriculum is not well implemented. And they're mm. calling for that kind of um, conversation in Parliament for change um, have been for a long time, but actually this resolution may well help them say, look, it's not just me or my personal story. This matters. Mm -hmm. And the UK and many others have agreed to this. So I'm happy to answer questions on a postcard as well, but I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of look for your context. How does it help you in your work? Um, mm -hmm. And you may be at a journey that is experienced or just starting out. And maybe we can give some examples um, in some future and some future sessions of ideas to help people. And um, forgive me that they're not available yet but <laughs> for this session, but I think we I think we could probably do it somehow. Yeah, with with the political yeah. you know, will that's here from so many folk. Yeah, there's look, there's plenty of passionate people out there. So I do think that the UN resolution is reinforcing of that work, and so um, taking it to as, as many audiences is uh, it can't be a, a bad thing. 
Um, the next question, I guess, um, is going to start with you, David. Given that the WHO was delegated authority, uh, responsibility to organise a World Drowning Prevention Day, um, maybe we spend the next five minutes or so just talking about what that could look like, because um, I know there's lots of people wanting to uh, eagerly plan for the 25th of July. Um, and I think this probably plays out differently at a global level and a regional level and a national level and possibly even at a local community level. So have you got some ideas of the sorts of things we might be looking to achieve on World Drowning Prevention Day? Only, only in the most uh, sort of general of, of senses. So, I mean, I think, I think we wanna certainly echo the, uh, the messaging that, that I think has been successful so far, you know, that, that I alluded to earlier, that this is, this is just, it's a big, big problem. It's a preventable problem. It requires coordination across sectors. It benefits from, um, you know, people sort of recognizing that there's sometimes synergistic benefits to to some of the interventions that that we talk about. So, for example, daycare. You know, this is a great example of where the benefits of daycare go far beyond drowning prevention. They they encompass a lot of other um, a lot of other benefits for for young children. So it's rightfully a, sort of a great thing to do for for early childhood development uh, in and of its in and of its own right. So somehow sort of finding ways to crystallize a few key messages that we want to communicate at that global level that will entice people to maybe think about drowning a little bit differently. Yeah. That'll be an important part of part of it. Um, but the human impact aspect is also likely going to be a really important thing. And, and as Gemma mentioned, you know, even even one death is, is too many if, that, if that's a member of your, your family. So what we've, uh, and, and here I think this this could sort of play well with, with ensuring we have participation of, of wider numbers of, of people, you know, within your countries, uh, virtually all of you would be in a position to, you know, to, to work within your own your own country's jurisdiction to pull together some sort of a world drowning prevention day commemoration and i think an important part of that is going to be somehow honoring the memories of people who have either had a fatal or a non-fatal drowning um and the impacts that 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 event has had on on the uh, the family members and the the, the mm -hmm. person concerned especially if it's if it's a non-fatal drowning so the human impact side i think would definitely be something but we as i've said earlier we are actually very open to people communicating directly with us and saying you know david what we would find really helpful if you know in terms of how who plans to commemorate this event mm -hmm. would be if who strive to do the following a b c that would actually be a really useful thing to um, for people to to feed to me you know in the coming uh, weeks I, if, mm -hmm. if anybody needs my email address it's meddings d like meddings david <laughs> at, at who.int and this is recorded so email me and and yeah. you know hit me up with your ideas um I, because it's I a guess very good time yeah, I guess, David, people, people are probably looking for a green light to act local, um, to take action locally. So um, I guess one of the things that is helping me understand what the World Drowning Prevention Day could look like is having a look at other international days, like, say, the International Day for Women. Um, it's a fantastic celebration all across the globe. Um, in Sydney, there might be five International Women Day breakfasts that go on on that day in the days before, in the days after, um, many organisations get behind that particular day and they, make, they bring meaning to it in terms of their context. The, Glo the, the George Institute for Global Health hosts a breakfast usually, the government's got one, many other organisations. So um, I, when I think about this World Drowning Prevention Day, I, I do think that the global piece is vitally important, um, but I just wonder whether or not we're able to think local and, and, and actually come up with some ideas that might sort of bring meaning to the, the World Drowning Prevention Day um, at, at an organisational level, at a country level, or even at a local uh, lifeguard academy level. Is that, you know, does that sound reasonable? 100%. Absolutely. No, no, I think that's, that's really, really a great, a great suggestion. And, and, you know, I would encourage people to look at how other international days are have been have been commemorated in, in other sectors because that's that's you know I'm sure we can collectively draw a lot of a lot of good ideas from that. 
as I said, this will be the first time that we've ever uh, done that, d done this day, and we'd like to use it to, mm. to mark the occasion as best we can. Might be a bit difficult on the very first iteration just because it's it's coming up on us with really yeah. very little uh, notice. But um, yeah, definitely, I think, I think the permission to act locally is absolutely correct. But again, emphasizing, you know, coherence of messaging, you know, thinking through a little bit strategically, you know, what are the key things we want to we want to see being communicated around drowning and drowning prevention. Yeah. Gemma, have you got some ideas on, on the sorts of tools that might be made available for World Drowning Prevention Day? And I do recognise it's, uh, it's a, what is it, eight weeks away or so? Yeah, um, 10 weeks, I was told yesterday. 10 weeks. It's eight yeah. weeks. Let's so, pretend it's eight weeks that will definitely focus our minds. Um, yeah, I've had some really lovely um, messages from colleagues, many on this call from around the world. It's been inspirational. Um, call out our friends in Brazil, who I think about 12 hours later were already showing me uh, how their um, national mascot cartoon was drawn. Was, was, yeah, Cartoon Crab was already at it. So thank you, David, for that. Um, I think, um, and, and things like, you know, simple stuff, if you're active on social media, you know, and being asked, oh, maybe we need to have a kind of central uh, hashtag. Yeah, good point. I think the messaging is really clear. As we put out some uh, messaging as a kind of soft launch of the adoption of the resolution, we did have some coherent messaging shared with friends. I think working with David, we can perhaps uh, be able to offer that as a, a you know, a, a small option for people to consider either amplifying um, in their national contexts um, or having a bit of a sense of, you know, what are the numbers we're talking about if it's globally and they want to make that point, you know, what are the global numbers, what are the national numbers, just things that will really help them. So I think there's some social media, maybe in your, you know, life saving club or your life boat station or whatever you have, you know, maybe there's a, there's a thing you do that day, maybe a celebration, an event, uh, maybe your, your staff on the beach that day, uh, your water safety educators, just make sure as part of their narrative, there's a highlight to tell people Hey, do you know what this is this is a big day today and you know look back but look forward so i think what we we see this as you rightly said um justin as an opportunity this is the first day uh, of forever let's call it that this is the first day of many um, it may for example in future next year i know a number of countries are, are going to be making sure that you know their national policy and plan is ready for next year and using yeah. that as a moment to hive around things i know yeah. a number of countries um, do have National Drowning Prevention Weeks or moments in their calendar, but not everybody does. Um, I think they're mostly in the minority and they you know real pathfinders on that. So hopefully this gives um, everybody a kind of anchor moment to get around, at least for one day, um, as, as a start of a tent, really. Yep. Yeah, and I will yeah, just I say that, sorry, yeah. just to say that, um, you know, uh, whatever you think, you know, I think we think that this day is something quite tangible for our community mm. and our sector and for those implemented by um, affected by this issue, but it's not a given. It's actually extremely difficult to get this kind of day. Um, yeah. European Union actually has a kind of red line on it. It's got thrown out at least once. <laughs> so just to say that, you know, it is, it is actually really important. So we should use it well um, yeah. and, and show that this day really matters to our community and our issue. And we can do that. We're amazing, you know, amazing group of people to do that. Absolutely, and play the long game. Um, let's ah, look long at game. how the yep. day <laughs> emerges over the next five years or so, and, and we can build from that. Um, look, I think that's a really nice uh, point to end on. I do think the majority of questions um, that we received after the resolution was about the day and when was the, when the day was getting organised. And I know that um, I know there was a group in Holland meeting last week to plan their World Drowning Prevention Day. So I think that will be a real day of excitement. And, and I hope that um, I hope that you everyone enjoys um, that celebration of, of drowning prevention on that day. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna leave the panel here just for a minute. Um, there's a couple of people I need to thank for making the webinar happen. Um, Monique Sharp is uh, at home. She's sick, she's been sick all week. Monique was essentially the event manager and she worked incredibly hard for the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in 2011 and, uh, and setting up the webinar. So we're gonna say hello to Monique somewhere in her lounge room. She's, um, she's wonderfully dedicated to, um, uh, to drowning prevention and to Royal Life Saving and to lots of colleagues on the webinar. Um, because Monique was sick, um, I also seconded Will Kuhn. Will, can you kind of come in a shot maybe and say hello? No, come and say hello. Will's over to the background, that's his hand. He has five fingers. Um, Will Kuhn is uh, studying with Rob Brander here at the University of New South Wales. Um, and, and I was uh, lucky enough to second him today and he spent the whole day helping us 
organise. Uh, Chris is over the back. Chris Groneman and Justin is here on camera as well. So we've had a really good team sort of gravitate around the, the day. And so I thank them for the support. And if we can go back to our panel, Will, is that all right? Um, and so I'd like to thank all of, uh, all of the people on chat, all of the people on webinar. There's been something like 99 plus different comments on chat. So that's a huge interaction. And, and maybe we'll down those, load those and have a look at some of the consistent themes that are coming out in the chat. Um, I'd like to thank you, Huan. It's lovely to see you again. Thank you very much for your contribution. And we do wish you all the best in, in Vietnam. I'd like to thank you also, Dr. Uh, Amina Rahman. It's always wonderful to see you. You've made such a huge contribution to the drowning prevention field over many decades now. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, to you, Gemma, um, it's fantastic. We all uh, are really uh, grateful for everything that you and Helen and Kate and James and Steve and Tom and everyone at the RNI have done for the drowning prevention um, in the last couple of years and also in the next decade. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and then finally to you, David, um, you've certainly been a revelation at the World Health Organization. Uh, it's been well more than a decade now, and we really appreciate um, everything you've done to uh, prioritize drowning prevention in your busy workload. Um, I think you've certainly adopted the passion that many of us have for drowning prevention and your contribution has, has been stellar and your friendship and um, collegiality is, uh, and the offer you've made to all the people on the webinar to contact you was really very generous of your time. And so um, we thank you. Um, and with that, I think we'll end the webinar, but um, thank you very much. Um, actually, should I give them the final word or we just wrap it up? Oh, and I was supposed to uh, promote the next World Conference on Drowning Prevention in 2023. We all hope we're able to meet today, together collectively in Colombo. So uh, I'd encourage you to look out for communication on that in the next 18 months or so. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks for joining us. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.